Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Section 1557, the 2022 Proposed Rule. My name is Marianne Tomazic. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a clinical lawyer at the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation of Harvard Law School. Chilpi, uh, for short, um, advocates for justice in the health and food systems. And here at the law school, we operate the Health Law and Policy Clinic where law students can join us for a semester or more to learn what it's like to be a healthcare lawyer. She'll be um, partners with the Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation to provide technical assistance to grantees. This includes both initiative wide technical assistance that's applicable to everyone and also project specific technical assistance for a specific grantee. And so for part of our initiative wide technical assistance, uh, we try to bring upcoming regulatory or policy changes um, likely to impact grantees and their work um, and uh, do some educational um, webinars and trainings um, about that. So for today's uh, webinar, the goal is to have uh, attendees leave with a better understanding of the proposed rule. Uh, as it relates to non-discrimination protections in health insurance, uh, in health programs and activities, and have a better understanding of how you could engage in the rulemaking process if you would like to. Soon you'll hear from two of my colleagues, uh, Suzanne Davies, who is uh, one of my, um, my colleagues here at the center, who is a, also a clinical lawyer. And you'll also hear from Kathy Zhang, who is a third year law student working in the clinic. Before I turn it over to Kathy and Suzanne, I'd like to just go over two housekeeping um, items. One is we are recording this webinar so that we can provide it online afterwards to folks who are interested but weren't able to attend at this particular time. And then the second housekeeping uh, item is that we will be reserving some time for a question and answer um, session at the end of the webinar. Uh, while we won't be calling on people who've raised their hands, we will be collecting questions through the Q&A button that should be at the bottom bar of your Zoom window. Uh, so please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A box. Um, and then afterwards, we'll highlight some of the questions and uh, get some answers from our panelists. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Kathy and Suzanne. Thanks, Marianne. Um, as uh, Marianne mentioned a second ago, my name is Kathy. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a third year uh, law student with the clinic um, and I'm from Tennessee originally. And Tennessee is one of uh, the handful of Medicaid expansion holdout states. It's also one of a few states that still has um, gender affirming care exclusions and its Medicaid program in violation of 1557. It's one of a handful of states that uh, the Health and Human Services Department had to work with during the height of the pandemic to change its crisis standards of care also because they were using um, discriminatory bases to uh, ration care. And so this is an issue that I think about a lot and um, will uh, hopefully be working on after graduation. Um, and I'm planning to work on uh, issues of Medicaid exclusions for gender affirming care in Tennessee and several other southern states. And so before we jump into uh, the presentation, I just want to give a quick roadmap of what we'll be going over. First, we'll be talking about what exactly 1557 is. Uh, we'll touch on a few examples of discrimination, so you will have an idea of what that looks like. Uh, Suzanne will be going over a history and timeline of previous rules and the controversy surrounding that rules. And then I'll dive into what the new proposed rule contains and why it's important for uh, public entities to be making um, comments and participating in the rulemaking process. And then Suzanne will close us out uh, with an overview of why uh, it's important also for future litigation purposes to build a strong administrative record and have those comments in. So 1557 is uh, the non-discrimination provision of the Affordable Care Act. And it prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability, in the context of health programs and activities that either receive financial funding from the federal government, so this includes tax credits, uh, federal subsidies, 
contracts of insurance. So if you think about Medicaid programs that receive both state and federal funding or state insurance plans that receive federal funding, um, those are all covered. And it also covers programs and activities that are administered by executive agencies or established under the ACA. And so in August, um, just a couple months ago, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services released a new rule that interprets 1557. And so some of those terms um, on the previous slide uh, that describes, say, programs and entities or different bases on which um, dis discrimination is prohibited uh, are a little ambiguous. And so these rules help interpret what exactly those mean. Um, and as you can see at the bottom, uh, the document has a comment period that runs until October 3rd. And so for the next two weeks, um, members of the public are invited to comment on the proposed rule and give their perspective as to things that can be changed, parts of it that should be kept. Um, and so far already over 17,000 comments um, have been submitted as of this morning. And so a couple examples that I wanna go over um, of what discrimination looks like happen both in the patient care context and then also in the insurance context. And this first one is um, discrimination uh, via clinical algorithms. And so clinical algorithms are a new part of the proposed rule that uh, wasn't in any of the previous rules and it prohibits all the discrimination uh, listed on that original slide in the context of decision-making that relies on clinical algorithms. And one of the clinical algorithms um, that's been talked about a lot uh, that uses um, uh, an impermissible factor as a basis uh, for, deter for determining care is the EGFR. And so that stands for estimation of glomerular filtration rate, and it helps evaluate kidney function. And so providers will use uh, EGFR measurements to help make decisions about whether a patient should be placed on a transplant list, whether they should be referred to a specialist or referred for kidney disease management, dialysis planning. And so it has a lot of implications for the kind of treatments that patients receive. And so among uh, other more objective factors that are related to kidney functions like uh, creatinine levels, the EGFR also takes into account race. And so it uses a coefficient um, based on whether or not the patient is black or non-black uh, to help determine what the ultimate uh, measurement number score is. And uh, on average, it tends to uh, basically overestimate the health of black patients' kidneys by 16%. And you can see in this chart, um, this is uh, a chart from a study in the Clinical Journal of American Society of Nephrology that shows that bottom line in red is what uh, the EGFR score would be for African-American patients when the coefficient isn't used. And then when the race coefficient is brought in, you see that blue line where the EGFR score gets much higher. And so there, there's some problems with the use of the race coefficient, um, not only just because it's, it uses race, but the use of race in the formula is also based on uh, faulty assumptions from uh, studies that have since been debunked. And those studies had claimed that black patients had greater muscle mass than white subjects. And so it led to this uh, follow-up faulty assumption that, that black patients had uh, better kidney functions naturally. And so in the formula, they uh, basically adjusted the, the EGFR scores accordingly. Um, but more recently, uh, back in 2020, um, a study in the Journal of General Internal Medicine actually found that uh, if Black patients um, were measured accurately using uh, scores that did not use a race coefficient, a third of them would have been reclassified into a more severe uh, chronic kidney disease stage. And so you can see that there's pretty um, severe impacts of using the EGFR race coefficient. And uh, about a year ago in September of 2021, the National Kidney Foundation and the American Society of Nephrology actually re recommended the use of an alternative equation, the CKD-EPI creatinine equation, which also measures kidney function, but doesn't adjust for race. And even before that, uh, multiple health systems have also moved away from using EGFR uh, race coefficients. And so those include um, the University of Washington, uh, UC San Francisco, Vanderbilt, Mass General, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and uh, Beth Israel. And then in the context of insurance, um, insurers also uh, 
will sometimes uh, violate 1557. As I mentioned earlier, Tennessee has an exclusion for gender affirming care in its Medicaid program. And Wisconsin also did before 2019. And so um, the exclusion was a, a form of discrimination based on sex. It was a categorical exclusion uh, where the Medicaid program would not cover gender affirming care for transgender beneficiaries who had gender dysphoria, but it would cover sometimes services uh, for other patients who were not being treated for gender dysphoria. So for example, if a patient needed a mastectomy for uh, breast cancer, then that might get covered, whereas a patient that needed the same service to treat gender dysphoria uh, would be denied care. And so in 2019, um, a federal court ruled that this was a violation of 1557, and the folks in the picture you see here are the named plaintiffs in the class action law uh, lawsuit that, um, that uh, brought down that ruling. So the actual words of section 1557 have remained static over time. They haven't changed, but Section 1557, which Kathy already explained at the beginning of this presentation, is very short and it doesn't get into a whole lot of detail about exactly how its non-discrimination protections are supposed to be implemented. And it also doesn't go into great detail about who exactly is protected other than the broad categories of race, color, national origin, sex, age, and disability. It also doesn't give a whole lot of detail about which specific entities are required to follow the non-discrimination law. For example, a health program or activity, any part of which is receiving federal financial assistance, may not discriminate, but the statute doesn't explicitly define what is meant by either of those phrases. Instead, Section 1557 tasks HHS with writing and publishing regulations that explain and implement the non-discrimination provisions in greater detail. Unfortunately, due to changes in presidential administrations, over time, HHS has published wildly different interpretations of Section 1557, resulting in very different versions of the interpreting rules. And on top of that, courts have also interpreted the rule and the statute in a few different ways. Before we move on, I just wanna make a quick note that although Kathy is spending most of our time here today talking about the Biden administration's proposed new rule, the rule that's actually still on the books and still has the force of law subject to a few court injunctions that we'll discuss later, is still the final rule from 2020 that was published under the Trump administration. And the new proposed rule, which was published in August, hasn't yet come into effect. Next slide, please. So as I just mentioned, HHS is the entity that's tasked with creating regulations that implement the text of section 1557. And up on the screen is a simplified picture of the basic timeline that happens during a rulemaking. First, the statute has to become law. And then if the statute identified an agency that is supposed to create additional rules, eventually that agency will publish something called a notice of proposed rulemaking. And this will consist of both the text of the new proposed rule and a preamble that basically shows the agency's work, explaining its reasoning and asking for input from the public. At that point, a public comment period will begin. In this case, two months, but that time can vary. And once the public comment period has ended, the agency reviews all of the comments that it received and determines whether or not the rule needs to be changed. If the answer to that question is no, or if the rule only needs to be changed in minor ways, the agency can then publish a final rule. And just a quick note that just because a rule becomes final doesn't mean it can't still be challenged in court or changed later by the agency. In the context of a rule being challenged in court, a plaintiff could make an argument that the rulemaking procedure wasn't followed correctly, or that the statute is contrary to law because it goes either beyond what the statute says or it doesn't match the text of the statute. Next slide, please. So my previous slide showed a generic timeline of a rulemaking. And this slide shows the timeline of the rulemaking for section 1557 so far. And as you can see, it's much longer. Um, over time, as I've mentioned, there have been several iterations of the rulemaking process for Section 1557. The Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010. And then finally, five years later, the Obama administration published its proposed rule and engaged in the rulemaking process, ultimately publishing a final rule in 2016. Then Trump took office. And the Trump administration went through a rulemaking process, ultimately publishing a final rule in 2020. 
Now that Biden is in office, the Biden administration is engaging in the rulemaking process for a third time. We're currently in the comment period because the proposed rule was published in August of 2022. And hopefully this will result in a final rule that is similar to the proposed rule that was published in August. But the fact that this timeline is so long and that this process has turned out to be so iterative raises a question as to whether or not Biden's final rule will really be a final rule or if in a new administration, we might start the process all over again. Next slide, please. Before I turn things back over to Kathy, I'm going to talk a little bit about what aspects of Section 1557 have been so controversial that they resulted in this flip-flopping back and forth across administrations. And this is a bird's eye view. So of course, there are other differences between the rules than the ones I'm going to identify here. The first big contentious issue is who exactly is protected by Section 1557, and specifically, what types of discrimination are included when we talk about discrimination on the basis of sex? The second issue is which entities are required to follow the rules and not discriminate, whether every entity in the healthcare space counts as a health program activity or not, and what kinds of affirmative steps covered entities have to take to remain in compliance with Section 1557. So to speak to the first issue, the accepted legal meaning of discrimination on the basis of sex has changed pretty drastically over time. If we turn the clock back to 2016, before the Supreme Court's decision in Bostock, HHS's first rule interpreting discrimination on the basis of sex did include gender identity and sex stereotyping, but not sexual orientation, and it also included discrimination based on termination of pregnancy. This was obviously controversial, and religious groups sued and won what was at least a temporary victory in a case called Franciscan Alliance v. Burwell. A federal district court issued an injunction to prevent HHS from enforcing those aspects of the 2016 rule that included gender identity and termination of pregnancy. In 2020, the Trump administration's final rule completely deleted the definition of discrimination on the basis of sex, claiming that a definition would be unnecessary and redundant, and strongly implying that Section 1557 didn't protect people on the basis of gender identity. This was immediately complicated by the fact that the Supreme Court did issue its opinion in Bostock, which in relevant part held that workplace sex discrimination under Title VII includes discrimination based on gender identity and discrimination based on sexual orientation. For technical reasons that I won't get into here, the fact that the Supreme Court had this ruling on what Title VII meant doesn't necessarily and automatically implicate Section 1557, but the same logic can obviously apply here as well. The result of the 2020 rule, which deleted the definition of discrimination on the basis of sex, was confusion because that rule left people unsure if Section 1557 applied to them or not, leading to difficulty in enforcement. So this leads me to a second sticking point, the scope and notice requirements. The 2016 rule had made it clear that covered entities included HHS programs and health insurers receiving federal funding, and it imposed detailed notice requirements on covered entities, including a requirement to provide notice of people's rights under the statute and information about certain language access requirements. The 2020 rule walked a lot of this back, first by severely narrowing the scope scope of who even counted as a covered entity. For example, under the 2020 rule, an entity providing health insurance is somehow not considered a health program or activity. And the 2020 rule also rescinded many of the 2016 rules notice requirements. Just as the 2016 rule had led to lawsuits, the Trump administration's 2020 rule also led to lawsuits, including one, Bagley v. HHS, that was brought by Chilby. This handful of new lawsuits much like the ones that had challenged the 2016 rule, sought to enjoin HHS from enforcing aspects of the new rule that were believed to be harmful. Due to injunctions that were ultimately issued by federal district courts in the cases Walker v. Azar and Whitman Walker Clinic v. HHS, HHS was ultimately enjoined from enforcing the 2020 rules repeal of parts of the definition of on the basis of sex, part of the rule that addressed equal program access on the basis of sex, and from enforcing the 2020 rules incorporation of a religious exemption from Title IX. But there are other parts of the 2020 rule, including the narrow definition of health program or activity that still currently remain in place. 
With this context, I'm going to turn it back to Kathy to talk about some of the ways that the 2022 proposed rule would strengthen non-discrimination protections if it becomes a final rule. Next slide, please. Thanks, Suzanne. Yeah, so I'm going to just jump into some of the features of the new proposed rule. Um, and as Suzanne mentioned earlier, the 2020 Trump rule uh, rolled back a lot of protections um, from the 2016 rule that this new proposed rule now restores. And so these include uh, the scope of what the 1557 law covers. Um, it adds back in HHS programs and insurers that receive federal funding. Um, it also uh, restores requirements for providing meaningful access to limited English proficiency individuals and also requirements that covered entities issue notices of non-discrimination and availability of assistive services for limited English proficiency individuals and people with disabilities. It also restores the definition of sex from the 2016 rule. It also requires that covered entities with 15 employees or more have compliance coordinators that help ensure that 1557 is being followed by the entity. And it also has staff training requirements so that uh, staff who need to be aware of what 1557 requires are all trained and actually have an understanding of that. And finally, it refines the process for raising uh, conscientious and uh, religious freedom objections. It also has a few new provisions too that weren't in any of the previous rules, uh, including a provision on clinical algorithms, um, such as the EGFR, as we mentioned earlier, also telehealth and uh, the applicability of the rule to Medicare Part B. And so as Suzanne covered pretty in depth earlier, uh, the scope of um, the 1557 rule has been expanded a bit from uh, when it was narrowed in uh, 2020 by the Trump administration. And so the Trump administration before had narrowed uh, the scope to cover only health care programs and activities administered by HHS under Title I of the ACA. And now the new scope covers all HHS health programs and activities. HHS is actually uh, asking commenters to comment on whether or not they should further expand the scope to include all programs and activities in HHS, not just the health related programs. It also clarifies that insurers receiving federal funding uh, are also covered entities um, and that 1557 will apply to an entity's entire business rather than only the part that receives federal funds. And again, as Suzanne mentioned earlier, uh, one of the other major rollbacks in the 2020 rule was uh, the um, removal of the definition on what it meant to uh, discriminate on the basis of sex. And so the new uh, proposed rule states that uh, prohibited discrimination on the basis of sex also includes discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, sex characteristics, and pregnancy-related conditions, including pregnancy termination. As for new provisions that have been added by the 2022 proposed rule, um, one of the proposed additions uh, would prohibit, discrimi prohibit discrimination um, uh, through the use of clinical algorithms in decision making. And so this would not hold covered entities liable for using algorithms that they didn't develop, but covered entities might be liable for discrimination that occurs when they rely too much on discriminatory algorithms. And so if uh, say a healthcare provider uses an algorithm that takes race into account um, when it shouldn't, and then it, based on that uh, algorithm makes a healthcare decision that discriminates against a patient, then they may be liable. And the proposed rule actually gives a specific example related to EGFRs, and it says that discrimination concerns will arise if a covered entity takes action based on an algorithm that results in a less favorable treatment of a black patient compared to white patients with similar or healthier kidneys because the algorithm determined that the black patient's kidney function was better than it actually was based on say a race coefficient. And then telehealth services are also now covered under 1557. And so uh, the new proposed rule would ensure that services and platforms um, used for telehealth are accessible to individuals with disabilities and also provide meaningful access to limited English proficient individuals. And HHS is again seeking comments for more details on this. Uh, right now, the, this section of the proposed rule doesn't have many details or examples of what this might actually look like and what affirmative requirements might exist for, say, a telehealth platform uh, in order to be in compliance with 1557. And so um, 
if you know uh, you work with uh, telehealth platforms uh, through your work and you have thoughts on certain affirmative features that would be good for the telehealth platform to have in order to ensure accessibility to any of these individuals, that would be a really good thing to comment on. Um, one of the features that the National Health Law Program has highlighted as um, a helpful requirement would be to ensure that telehealth platforms uh, have capabilities for hosting uh, American Sign Language interpreters in their uh, telehealth platform so that if, say, a provider is uh, showing documents to a patient, they can also simultaneously have a video feed of the interpreter at the same time. And then finally, we're going to talk about Medicare Part B, um, which previously Section 1557 did not apply to. Uh, and so now in the proposed rule, it would extend 1557 to uh, entities receiving Medicare Part B payments to physicians and other outpatient providers. And the reason this didn't uh, apply in the past was because in the 1960s, um, the department that preceded HHS had previously interpreted Medicare Part B as not being technically federally subsidized. And on account of this, civil rights laws that only applied to programs that were federally subsidized, such as uh, Title VI um, of the Civil Rights Act, did not apply to Medicare Part B. And so the new rule applies uh, Title VI, Section 1557, and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act all to recipients of Medicare Part B patient or payments. Um, and in, in practice, I wanna highlight, this doesn't change um, practices for most covered entities because most entities that receive Part B payments are actually already covered entities under 1557. And so for the most part, um, there won't be a lot of changes to most practices, but this does cover some gaps. And then as I've been talking, I've been highlighting parts of the proposed rule where HHS is inviting comments. Um, and part of this is because, uh, because this is a proposed rule, and as Suzanne mentioned earlier, there will still be a final rule uh, in a matter of time, usually about a year from now. HHS has to take time to consider what the public thinks about the proposed rule and then incorporate those comments into its decision for the final rule. And so commenting gives HHS different perspectives to consider from various stakeholders. And it's a chance to not only highlight places where the rule should be changed or where you need clarification, but also to affirm positive aspects of the proposed rule. And so some of the parts we highlighted earlier where the 2022 rule brings back protections that were previously rolled back um, even if those protections are already in there and you like what the proposed rule says, this is also an opportunity to simply affirm that um, so that later when uh, the rule is challenged in subsequent litigation, the agency can defend it on those bases. And Susanna will talk a little bit more about that. And if you do want to submit a comment, there are several ways to do that. Um, one of them is to sign on to a larger comment. And so Sometimes uh, healthcare coalitions and institutions will make broad comments about uh, new administrative rules on the whole. CHILPI is doing that right now with the HIV Healthcare Access Working Group. Um, and those comments are sometimes opened up so that other institutions can sign on in agreement with them. You can also write your own comment uh, as an institution about parts of the rule that affect you directly. Um, and CHILPI is doing that also with the Disability Law Center, and we're writing a smaller comment on the clinical algorithms portion of the proposed rule in particular. Individuals uh, can also submit comments, and a lot of healthcare advocacy groups actually have portals to assist individuals in submitting comments. And so um, a couple of those include Protect Trans Health, which is run by the Transgender Law Center, the National Trans Center for Transgender Equality, and the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund, which allows um, both trans patients and also just allies and other people and providers to comment about uh, the rule. And then the National Health Law Program also has a portal called My Care Counts. And so uh, if you see in the bottom right-hand corner here, it has a template where you can go on their website and they already have a preamble to a comment that you can then fill in details for and then submit personal information in support of the rule. And as a practical matter, when you go to submit a comment, um, you can find uh, the link there when you go to the Federal Register and look up the rule, and then there's a green button there uh, through which you can submit comments until 11.59 p.m. on October 3rd, 
and that's 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. So as Kathy mentioned, one of the reasons it's really important to participate in the comment process and to get a lot of comments from a lot of different types of people and organizations is that we need a strong administrative record. The controversial aspects of Section 1557 haven't gone away, and there are already new challenges on the horizon. Even before the proposed new rule was published, some of these challenges had already been brought in court, particularly by religious entities seeking to enjoin the Biden administration from enforcing any interpretation of Section 1557 that would require the provision of gender-affirming care or coverage for gender-affirming care. And it's practically a guarantee that there are going to be more lawsuits in the future. As I mentioned earlier, one way to attack agency rules in court is to argue that the agency, in this case HHS, didn't adequately consider comments by the public during its rulemaking process. And this is a tactic that people on all sides have used when they had a rule that they thought wasn't right or didn't sit well with the statute. This means that anyone who supports HHS's proposed changes to the new rule, or new proposed changes to the rule, excuse me, can help HHS bolster its position in future litigation by saying so in comments. And to the extent that there are still aspects of the rule that there could, that could see to be improved, it's really important to say that too. I'm going to turn it back to Kathy one more time to talk about some key takeaways. Thanks, Suzanne. So just to recap, um, Section 1557 is the non-discrimination provision of the ACA that prohibits discrimination in a variety of healthcare contexts. And the rules that interpret 1557 can be changed and challenged as they have been in past years. And so this new proposed rule restores and strengthens a lot of the old protections, and it also adds new protections uh, related to the use of clinical algorithms and decision-making, uh, telehealth, and also uh, applies the rule to um, entities receiving Medicare Part B payments. HHS is currently uh, seeking input on the proposed rule uh, up until August, or excuse me, October 3rd, um, and comments are really crucial to HHS uh, forming their final rule and also in building a strong administrative record for when the final rule is inevitably litigated again. And with that, I'll open it up uh, to any questions that Marianne might have fielded. Thank you so much, um, Kathy and Suzanne. Um, I'll just encourage folks to um, remind folks rather that they can drop comments in the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, I have two questions that I think that I'll direct to Kathy that I think you could probably answer both of them um, at the same time. One is what resources are there for institutions and organizations to submit comments uh, about the proposed rule? And the second question is how long do the comments need to be? And can you just comment on one part? Yeah, so those are both great questions. Um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, for individual comments, there are some portals. And then as for, say, if you wanna do an institutional comment, uh, regulations.gov, um, has examples of previous comments, or rather than examples, they're actually previous comments that have been submitted that are publicly available to see. And so um, if you're thinking about uh, trying to find ways to format or phrase a comment as an institution, that's a good starting point. Um, and then the second question was how long these comments need to be right in the scope or uh, how much you can comment on. And so as I mentioned earlier with Chilpi, um, we're commenting both uh, on the entire proposed rule with the HIV healthcare access working group. And we're also doing another comment that just talks about the clinical algorithms component of the proposed rule. And so first of all, that shows an institution can submit multiple comments, um, which you should feel free to do and also feel free to submit comments in your individual capacity. Um, and then you can also submit comments on specific portions of the rule. And so you don't have to have thoughts on the entire rule um, and there's no like content limit or minimum. And so individual comments, for instance, can be as short as, you know, I am somebody who identifies in this way. I've had this experience. This is why these protections matter to me or why I need clarifications about these protections. And so there's um, no real limits to the amount of commenting that can happen. And um, it in invites, I think, a, a potential for a, a range of participation. And I'd highly encourage you all to participate both in your personal and institutional capacities. 
Thanks. And a, a, another question. Under the proposed rule about the broader scope, what programs administered by HHS, um, specifically non-health programs, would be subject to Section 1557? Yeah, so this is actually a, a point where I think it would be really great to for people to comment on asking for clarifications. So HHS does have some financial assistance programs um, and other social support programs that are arguably um, not technically healthcare related, but which uh, contribute to social determinants of health and could arguably also be considered um, health related programs. And so this is something where I, I think um, it would be helpful in the actual final rule for HHS to clarify uh, what exactly falls within those scopes. Um, another question, which I'll direct to Suzanne. Um, we talked about a number of ways that people can be protected from discrimination um, under the proposed rule. What should someone do if they uh, feel like they've been discriminated against in a way that they should be protected by this law. So if you feel that you've experienced discrimination in a way that section 1557 protects against, you have a couple of options. And one of those might be to take advantage of the fact that section 1557 provides a private right of action. So you could bring your own lawsuit if you wanted to. But the other option that you have is that you could submit a complaint to OCR, letting them know that you've experienced discrimination and letting them know all of the details of what happened. Great. Well, thank you both for um, joining and, and sharing a little bit about Section 1557. Um, I am happy if there are any questions um, to um, accept them via email, and then I can also check in with the panelists if there are any specific questions about resources that were mentioned today. Um, thank you everyone for joining and um, have a great weekend.